So welcome everyone to uh, this open online meeting of the British chapter of the International Association for Religious Freedom. It's great, uh, good that you could all join us today. Um, I'd like to welcome um, you all and welcome especially our speaker, Don De Silva. Don is a former um, senior official at the UN Environment Programme. He's a university Buddhist chaplain and is a council member of the Faith Forum for London. Uh, his talk should last about 40 minutes, followed by a 20 minute Q&A. So I'd like to invite him um, to talk on the topic of beyond religion, faith, environment and justice. So over to you, Don. You want to screen share. I yes, think. before I do that, let me first thank you for inviting me, Derek. And also I would like to thank uh, my dear friend Jahangir Sarosh for actually proposing this event. Now I will be sharing the screen. So going into screen share. Can you see me? Yep. Yes. Can you can. see the screen? Yes, yes, it's very Brilliant. Good. Is everything good there? Hello? Still yes, good. all good, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, good afternoon to you from as far as UK time is concerned. And thank you for those far and wide who have joined this discussion. This is a really important discussion, particularly for IARF, because you have been at the forefront of justice issues for a very long period of time. Whilst my theme is beyond religion, faith and justice and the environment, I'll be focusing, particularly after having a discussion with Derek on environmental conflict issues in particular in this presentation. So this is my background. I used to work with the United Nations Environment Program since its establishment and in Nairobi in Kenya. It would be of interest to know that UNEP is not headquartered either in Washington or in Geneva, but in Nairobi, in Kenya, and it's the first UN international agency to be headquartered in a developing country. This is my dear colleague, Maury Strong, the first executive director and the first undersecretary general for uh, of the United Nations responsible for environmental issues with whom I worked for a fairly long period of time. This was my milieu, my areas where I used to work. Today, humankind is facing two related existential threats which impinge on our freedoms. Climate change and COVID-19. And so this presentation for you as representatives of faith is critical. Climate change is not anymore about future generations environment and its challenges are no longer anymore about future generations. It is here and now. We have just witnessed, or we are continuing to witness, historic heat waves, extreme drought, wildflower, wildfires, which are impacting the North American West. 
and the summer of 2021 is already shaping to be one for the record books with much of the North American West gripped by these issues. One Seattle resident put it like this. It felt like we'd set our earth on fire. A background about environmental issues. So the modern environmental issues came into being when they were highlighted by the famous Rachel Carson in her book, Silent Spring, where she talks about the fact that the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction. And she also pointed out in the book, in nature, nothing exists alone. Again, another woman leader, Indira Gandhi, addressed the first Earth Summit of the UN Conference on the Human Environment. This was the first Earth Summit I attended as a young journalist. And she highlighted the importance of poverty because at that time, when the environmental issues first came into vogue throughout the world, the developing nations were a bit reluctant to engage because they thought that this was a gimmick from the West to stifle economic growth and developmental programs to deal with poverty. The presence of Mrs. Gandhi was vital in securing the support of developing nations to engage in environmental issues. And she pointed out very bluntly in her presentation that unless we are in a position to provide employment and purchasing power for the daily necessities of the tribal people and those who live in or around our jungles, we cannot prevent them from combining the forests for food and livelihood, from poaching and from despoiling the vegetation. When they themselves feel deprived, how can we urge the preservation of animals? How can we speak to those who live in villages and in slums about keeping the oceans, the rivers, the air clean when their own lives are contaminated at the source. So she pointed out that the environment cannot be improved in conditions of poverty. There is a lot of discussion about sustainability. And sometimes I get the feeling that people don't have a clue as to what they are talking about. I was at the forefront of the discussions in UNEP about sustainability and we talked of many different uh, words to describe sustainability, environmentally sound, sustainable development and so on, which were too long. But there was in the mid 1980s, a very important commission, the World Commission on Environment and Development, which was chaired by Gro Harlem Brundtland, the former prime minister of Norway, which really brought down and nailed the meaning of sustainable development. And the commission defined sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And sustainable development is not simply about conservation 
conservation of wildlife or about picking up litter and so on. Those are extremely important, but you will see that the 17 sustainable development goals, which we adopted in 2014 at the 20 years um, anniversary of the uh, agenda 21 of uh, the United Nations Environment Programs uh, Summit, where all members have now signed up to, include a variety of different topics. What is the link between faith and sustainability? Initially, and I was responsible for particularly interacting with the non-governmental sector during my work with UNEP. Some religious leaders were cautious about the environmental movement. Several voiced concerns about the holistic approach of ecology and the understanding that humankind is part of a wider ecosystem. Some used to say that these perspectives were contrary to some religious teaching, which held that man has dominion over the earth. So the fact that humankind should live in harmony with nature is found in all faiths. We go to the important statement that was made by Pope Francis in his seminal publication, Laudato Si. In that publication, which was done in 2015, this very important publication points to the situation as follows. It says, we are not God. The earth was here before us and it has been given to us. This allows us to respond to the charge that Judeo-Christian thinking on the basis of the Genesis account, which grants man dominion over the earth, as in Genesis 1.28, has encouraged the unbridled exploitation of nature by painting him as domineering and destructive by nature. This is not a correct interpretation of the Bible as understood by the church, although it is true that we Christians have at times incorrectly interpreted the scriptures nowadays we must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies absolute domination over other creatures. Pope Francis says in the document, the biblical texts are to be read in their context with appropriate hermeneutic recognizing that they tell us to till and keep the garden of the world. Long before modern science, many spiritual texts have highlighted the need for people to live in harmony with nature. Now, I, this is the document which earlier on Pope Francis referred to. I'm sorry, I've done a duplication, but I'll move on. The word ecology was coined in 1866 by the German scientist Ernest Haeckel. Ecology means the, house, the study of habitat, the study of relationships between living organisms, including humans and their physical environment. But long before Heichel, more than 2,500 years ago, the Buddha highlighted 
the concept of paticca samuppada, commonly translated as dependent origination or dependent arising, which states that all dhammas, conditions arise in dependence on other dhammas. If this exists, that exists. If this ceases to exist, that also ceases to exist. Buddhism is firmly based on the principle that nature is dynamic. According to Buddhism, changeability is one of the perennial principles of nature. Everything changes in nature, nothing remains static. This is the concept expressed by the Pali term anicca. I have highlighted this particular example because this is the faith that I know the best, but you will definitely be having different examples in your own respective faiths. The Buddha also focused on sustainability. And for, as far as sustainability for him was concerned was lasting welfare and happiness. Diga Ratnam Hitaya Sukhaya, which is mentioned over and over again in the texts. We move to environmental conflicts. Environmental conflicts are a symptom of bad governance, unbridled market forces and self-interests. And I think we need a different kind of peace building efforts, which are increasingly focusing on effective and sustainable management of key natural resources to help countries achieve sustainability and development. With COVID-19, we realize that nature is not as fragile as it was depicted to be. Climate change and COVID-19 go beyond gender, race, creed, and religion. They don't discriminate. Sajid Javed, UK's new Secretary of for Health, put it this way, we know we cannot simply eliminate it. We have to learn to live with it. This is a far cry from the earlier tub thumping statements that were issued particularly by political leaders throughout the world that this is a virus which needs to be beaten, that we are at war and language of that nature. According to the Global Envi Atlas of Environmental Justice, there are some 3,458 cases ongoing at the moment of environmental conflicts. Traditionally, the most common environmental elements around which conflicts can erupt are water flow, diversion, salinization, floods, and pollution. And in direct international or indirect international conflicts are commonly caused by resource depletion issues, deforestation, soil erosion, desertification, flooding, and so on, particularly described as shared natural resources. Now, concerning conflict, we had some really alarming recent uh, events concerning shared natural resources within the UK and beyond. Two British gunboats were dispatched by the UK government to, to Jersey after around 80 French boats gathered there 
to demand access to the island's fishing waters. The development came as France also sent naval patrol boats and threatened to cut power to the island. Jersey, which is a British crown dependency, sits on the English Channel less than 20 miles off the French coast. The British naval boats, which are equipped with guns, were then sent after France's Minister for the Seas, Enric Giardin, threatened to cut off the power to Jersey. She was angered by the fact that Jersey had issued post-Brexit licenses to French fishing boats, which imposed restrictive conditions, including the amount of time they could spend in the Jersey waters. Then again, legal action is now spreading concerning environmental issues throughout the world. And businesses are facing a fresh wave of legal action, holding them accountable for their greenhouse gas omissions. According to a report from UNEP, the number of climate litigation cases has surged in the last four years and now stands at 1,550 in 38 countries. In a surprising ruling, the multinational oil and gas company Shell was ordered by a court in the Netherlands to cut its emissions by 45% in the next decade. So Shell has said it would appeal against it. And this particular matter is ongoing. Then in Colombia, a group of young plaintiffs successfully sued the government, winning a Supreme Court judgment in the country that forced the state to develop a plan to halt deforestation in the Amazon. In the case, Future Generations versus the Ministry of the Environment and others, the Colombian court recognized the plaintiff's constitutional rights to life, health, subsistence, freedom, and human dignity, which it said were linked to the state of the Amazon. Then again, legal action in Pakistan. In Sheikh Asim Farooq versus the Federation of Pakistan recently, and you will find the information to your right. Citizens sued several administrative agencies for failing to protect national forests under several legislative acts designed to protect and restore forests. The courts agreed ordering among other things that the applicable laws shall be implemented in letter and spirit in order to plant, protect, and preserve the forests. The interesting thing with COVID-19, which we need to point out, is that these warnings have come before. That is the reason why COVID-19 has the number COVID-19, because there have been 19 viruses of, a, of similar genre before. The 1992 report from the National Academy of Sciences, for example, cited a number of ways climate change could lead to the spread of infectious diseases and described the lack of resources devoted to studying the impact of climate change on diseases as disturbing. Four years later, in the Journal of the Medical Association, warned that climate change could increase the spread of everything from malnutrition to malaria and so on. In the same year, WHO published 
a 300 page tome on the topic, looking for ties between climate and health. But at the same time, noting that the links are complex and multifactorial. So for many years, scientists have been warning about the links between climate change and viruses. A study of the 2002-3 severe acute respiratory, respiratory syndrome SARS outbreak concluded the presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV-like viruses in horseshoe bats together with the culture of eating exotic animals in southern China is a time bomb. So you also have the outbreak of swine flu in 2009. According to studies carried out by the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, points out that the virus resulted from the reassortment, a process through which two or more influenza viruses can swap genetic information by infecting a single human or animal host. When reassortment does occur, the virus that emerges will have some gene segments from each of the infecting parent viruses and may have different characteristics that either of parental viruses, just as children may exhibit unique characters that are like both their parents. In this case, in the case of H1N1, the reassortment appeared, appears most likely to have occurred between influenza viruses circulating in North American pig herds and among Eurasian pig herds. Along with the conflicts concerning environmental issues have always been since climate change was first mooted and since UNEP was established about threats to scientists. And we have a recent situation here with Dr. Fauci, the director for the US National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And he has been the subject of many threats to his life. More recently, a couple of days ago, we had one of UK's foremost experts, Dr. Chris Whitty, who was also jostled by a group of people and manhandled. So we, again, with this move to the current conflicts and situation concerning vaccines. There is a conflict between the rich nations and their usage of vaccines and the poor nations and the use of vaccines. You will find that rich nations are vaccinating one person every second, while the majority of the poor nations are yet to be given a single dose. COVID-19 has resulted in also conflicts, mental health issues, problems within and between communities and families. And this is the case of an article written by a young person in the Daily Telegraph, which says, I've just had the jab and it has driven a wedge between me and my anti-vax mother. By the way, Derek, I hope you are keeping a time on uh, this presentation. Please give me a heads up for about five minutes before so that then I can wrap up. There are other issues concerning 
climate matters and that concerns climate refugees. Environmental migrants are people who are forced to leave their home region due to sudden and long-term changes to their local environment. These are changes which compromise their well-being or secure livelihood. And such changes are due to drought, desertification, sea level rise, and so on. And so now we have climate refugees to deal with. And also the world is at the risk of climate apartheid, where the rich pay to escape the heat and hunger caused by the escalating climate crisis while the rest of the world suffers. And then the UN report concludes human rights might not survive the coming upheaval. The conflicts with resource consumption. People in rich countries consume up to 10 times more natural resources than those in the poorest countries. On average, an inhabitant of North America consumes around 90 kilograms of resources each day in Europe, consumption is around 45 kg per day, while in Africa, people consume around 10 kg per day. We also have conflicts with wildlife. Humanity has wiped out 60% of mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles since 1970 leading the world's foremost experts to warn that the annihilation of wildlife is now an emergency which threatens civilization. There are new threats also in the horizon. The rise of nationalism, my country right or wrong, which sets the clocks back on global agreements, which some have put together on matters such as climate change. Neo-nationalism is a type of nationalism that arose in the mid 2010s in Europe and North America to some degree in other regions. It is now back in force. But at the same time, the interesting thing is that environment can also unite nations. And during the early 1980s, I was part of a team which worked to establish the South Asia Cooperative Environment Program. And in the South Asian region, we achieved something that was unique. And when we started this initiative, people thought we would never succeed, but it is quite interesting to see that the countries in the region decided to shed their differences and come together to establish the South Asia Cooperative Environment Program and intergovernmental organization, which involves Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. The headquarters of this uh, body is in Colombo in Sri Lanka. It is still nascent. It is still at a small scale. But the interesting thing is that despite the various political aspects in the region, this little uh, organization has continued to survive. And there are some activities that are happening which unite the countries in the region. And in my own perspective, this has to be the way forward. And to deal with 
the critical issues which we are facing, we will have to move beyond religion. It is clear that throughout the world, the faith communities are performing and acting as a force for good. At the same time, we need now within the faith communities to provide that added value, which has not been dealt with by the environmental movements. We need to deal with the environment in the environment. Faith and sustainable issues are two sides of the same coin. Sustainable development demands faith involvement. We cannot solve climate change without faith communities. And there are some 5.2 billion people on the planet. And it would be inconceivable to think that we would be able to deal with climate change issues, environment challenges, or COVID-19 issues without the clear engagement of the faith communities. The challenges to faith. Of course, making faith centers environmentally sound is a very important area which religious faith institutions are now working on. But can faith facilitate the creation of value-based models of sustainable development throughout the world? Vaccinations are a short-term solution to COVID-19. Sustainability is the lasting solution. Faith communities are multinational. Religions have major financial assets across the world. The time has come to invest in ethical initiatives. Religious leaders should play a frontline role in mobilizing people to take action against environmental conflicts. The international reach of faith-based organizations give religious groups an unrivaled ability to encourage a large proportion of the world's population to take on environmental challenges. And so as far as the future is concerned, religious leaders should use their influence to motivate believers to reduce the environmental impacts of their lives. The international faith organizations need to be able to work with concerned science, and I repeat that, with concerned science to make a difference for now to deal with the critical and serious challenges that we experience now and for the future of our children and theirs. I thank you very much for your patience in listening to me and I welcome any comments or questions. Over to Derek. Thank you, Don. I wonder, would you please end the screen share and then we can all see each other? Brilliant. Yeah. So I'd first of all like to thank you for that very clear um, and stimulating talk. Thank you for the images. They really brought it home to me, uh, some of the issues. I, we are still recording, so will everyone bear that in mind? Um, I think I can see everyone in front of me on the screen. So we now have 20 minutes for questions, comments, and um, I think we're a small enough group to open the floor. For those who are, I can't, can't see because you um, are not showing your face. If you want to ask a question, put, put it in the, in the chat. You, so I'll open up the floor. Does anyone want to start? P 
perhaps I will I will start one and then then oh no we I've got your hangar so go ahead your hangar. Thank you very much and thank you Don. My question is simple. You mentioned something about the climate and COVID affecting human rights. Could you say something more on that? Yes, at the, at the, thanks so much. Clearly at the moment, there is no doubt that we have to adjust to, for instance, even within the faith communities. With COVID-19, we have to adjust to how we now conduct our faith services and how many people there should be, how many people should attend faith services, how many people should attend uh, events like marriages, deaths, births, and so on, is something that is impacting at the moment. There are conflicts, there is dissatisfaction within some faith groups and those who are in authority. Then comes COVID-19 and the right or the responsibilities to health. There are the majority of the people throughout the world don't have access to vaccines, as I said earlier. They require vaccines. There are some situations here, particularly in the rich nations where some of the vaccines are now being dumped or ditched because they have um, exceeded their sell by date or they're no longer valid. Each person should have the ability to live a life that is harmonious and peaceful. But we don't have that. Now, when you look at, for instance, the way in which vaccines are being brought, bought and distributed, I'd like to, as far as my own faith situation is concerned, move the argument or the discussion from rights to responsibilities, to be able to see our responsibilities as an individual to the other, rather than simply rights. Thank you, Don. Uh, could I perhaps fol follow up on that one? Is there any, have you come across any evidence where vaccine distribution where minority groups around the world, perhaps on a religious basis, are being discriminated against. There were certainly in the early days of the pandemic, I recall in India, where the where Muslims were blamed in inverted commas for for the uh, uh, for the pandemic, and and likewise, religious some religious groups uh, were blamed in in Europe for for hotspot for holding events, which then became super spreaders. Any views on that? And that yes, language I of... Yes, I don't want to go into the blame game hmm. because I think we have to really move out of the blame game. We have the situation concerning COVID, dealing with COVID-19. COVID is here to stay. And we have to learn to live with viruses like this and also what might come in the future, because we don't know what will come in the future. And this particular virus is mutating. So you don't know what the predictions are as far as the future is concerned. But without going into the blame game, because there are so many different communities right across the world, some who have in different parts of the world an open defiance against vaccinations. 
some who are pointing out that vaccination, that vaccines are the mark of the devil, for instance. You read them in newspapers and so on. So those of us particularly who are involved in faith traditions have a serious responsibility as far as humankind is concerned, is to ensure that we work with concerned scientists to ensure that we think beyond ourselves into thinking of what the wider, uh, wider needs are for the communities to survive. Thank you, Don. Floor is open. Just indicate. Or... There is another uh, question. Uh, there's an the interesting comment by Finn Perot yeah, in the chat yes. section. I understand there is a way of investing money called Islamic finance. I wonder if you've heard of any movements that bring sustainability and faith together in the same way. Yes, Finn, would you like to elaborate on that a bit? Yep, come in. Well, I don't know much more about it. That's why I was asking the question. Um, as far as I'm concerned, Islamic finance uses the morals of the Islam in order to invest money. So it avoids alcohol and other drugs um, for example, and other things, I'm sure. And I was wondering, you know, that that seems to be a successful merger of putting faith into real world applications of usually agnostic things like banking. Um, yeah, and I was wondering if there is, if there are any other movements that do the same with environmental sustainability and faith. Indeed, and faith will have to be increasingly dealing with this very important issue. Thank you very much for raising this. Because throughout the world, religious institutions, religious organizations are a significant source of economic strength. Along with Islamic financing, Again, you have now the increasing realization that faith communities need to evaluate their own investments. Think of it, for instance. The Church of England has an endowment of 8.7 billion pounds, generating 1 billion pounds in income. Now, the interesting thing is that the Church of England has pointed out that it is committed to being an ethical investor. The, in the United States, the, according to the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation, religious bodies, religious organizations contribute something like U.S. $1.2 trillion to the social economic side of the US economy. So if we can start with moving these substantial assets that the religious organizations have towards ethical investment, that would be a huge, important development for the future of this planet. Thank you. Anyone? I, I see a hand from Charanjit. You're muted. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, Don, for um, that very thought-provoking um, uh, presentation. Uh, and I know that quite a number of people are from across the globe who have joined here, but I was just thinking uh, in relation to COVID-19 and uh, the role of the local interfaith groups. So I'm not talking about a particular faith group, but interfaith groups joining hands with directors of public health in order for all communities, especially BME, BME communities, 
being involved in um, vaccination programs and test and trace programs. I'm just speaking on uh, in relation to my experience as as local chair of local interfaith group uh, and uh, particularly i think in the mosques and the gurdwaras it's been a very successful one initially it didn't happen but over a period um, community groups not necessarily the sikhs coming to the sikh temple to do that or the muslims coming to the mosque in order to have it, but people felt comfortable in places of worship to have it. So th th there are opportunities uh, and which are being exploited for, uh, you know, doing things to help with dealing with this uh, virus, um, which is obviously worrying to many many faith communities at the moment so it's the the link with the scientists which you have been saying is very important at this point in time for leadership of faith communities i totally agree thank you very much ma'am for that very very important observation um this is something which i also have experienced also in my interactions as a council member with the Faiths Forum for London. Mm -hmm. As you said very rightly, initially there, was a there were reservations. Mm -hmm. Initially within the faith organizations, the concerns were about how many people are allowed to attend services and so on. Yeah. And then there was the more wider concern and a shift in thinking. Mm -hmm. And now to see in different faith communities, the faith centers now established and at the forefront in providing vaccinations, mm -hmm. both the first and the second shots, and then also providing leaflets, yeah. carrying out information. Mm -hmm. And I see now uh, very repeatedly, for instance, um, discussion groups between, between within uh, by organized by faith communities involving those of the medical professions within their own mm -hmm. faith communities and the communities mm -hmm. is playing a major role in making sure that the vaccination drive is being reached among various different communities. That's a very, very important factor. Yes. Thank you very much. I see uh, uh, Father... Uh, Fakri. Yes. Ed. We're, we're not we're not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Oh yes. We, yes now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Don, for this wonderful presentation, actually capturing um, um, all relevant topics and um, and very much relevant to um, to ignite how to think about the relationship between faith communities and the environment. Um, I just want to make a comment. Uh, since my childhood, I belong to the Coptic Orthodox Church. It's a Christian church originating in Egypt. And since my childhood, I always listen to this prayer, which is prayed every morning in the church, every morning and uh, in some days in the evening as well which says, for example, graciously, O Lord, uh, the waters of the river this year to bless them. And then I find the deacon saying, for example, pray for the rising of the waters of the river this year, that Christ our God may bless them and raise them according to their measure. And he may give, give joy to the face of the earth and sustain us, the sons of men, and save the cattle and forgive us our sins. In addition to other prayers, all about um, the air of the heavens, the fruits of the earth, the waters of the river, the seeds, the herbs, the plants, the feed of the field this year, um, and, and the animals. What I want to say is this has created something inside all the congregation, including myself, that there is that the environment is part of my faith. Mm, yeah. And it, it made it easy for 
the attitude itself, even when you want to invest later or do any, any major work later, to feel that the environment and all living uh, organisms around you is part of your faith. So uh, I'm sure similar, similar prayers are there uh, in um, other uh, religions. But this, um, if, if it is not, a, I think one of the roles of the faith communities to ensure that the environment is part of who you are if you belong to this faith. Yes. Uh, Investment would work marvelously actually, but it, it, it working on the heart of the people would, would actually make a major impact. And I think this is one of the ways to, um, to work on the heart of people and their faith themselves, uh, because investment will attract um, a portion of people who are intellectually engaged with with these topics. But um, but I think uh, making it part of the faith is very important. May I comment on that? Of course. Thank you, Father Fakri. I think the you have hit the nail on the head. And the critical element is that what you have said resonates in every other spiritual tradition. The critical thing is that we need to now have this challenge of being able to move beyond faiths in order to be able to tackle these existential threats within traditions that may not have cooperated within our own communities, spiritual traditions, as well as outside our religious communities. And the clear factors of environmental challenges, COVID-19 challenges, which do not discriminate. Climate change is not going to come Climate change doesn't come and ask you which particular faith do you belong to in that particular region before it makes an impact. So we have, as faith organizations, we have a fundamental responsibility for now and the future in being able to work together together to deal with the challenges which threaten of a survival. It cannot be more clearer than that in terms of working together. And my own personal belief is that the challenges that we face would enable us to unite and work together rather than working in isolation. This is the fundamental plea that I would like to put to organizations like IARF and so on, because we have to now move faith organizations to deal with this critical issues that we face now. Thank you, Don. That's a, a very challenging but, but essential message. Now, most of us are from the, the UK, uh, but we have a couple of visitors. Um, I wonder if they want to, want to say anything or ask a question. Maranoro from Japan. Michino, would you want to say anything? And Phyllis from Jamaica. Um, I'm from Tokyo and uh, I'm, thank you very much for our presentation, Mr. Suva. I'm a Buddhist also. And very happy to hear that uh, you refer to uh, Anicca, the law of impermanence. And as far as I see, I, I don't think that uh, even the people in developed countries are happy at all because uh, the people in uh, developed countries, uh, such as uh, European countries or America or Japan, are all, they are all not happy because they are neurotic diseases. <laughs> Although we don't have any hunger, 
but neurotic diseases. So all people, as far as they live, they have to uh, face dukkha, sufferings. Uh, so why we suffer? Because we suffer because we attach to likes and dislikes. That's all the reason to cause every kind of uh, problems and in all levels, levels uh, and human problems. So uh, without uh, uh, be aware that those dislikes and likes causing uh, problems, we cannot solve any problem uh, that we are facing. That's my yeah. small comment. Thank you. Thank you. Don't you want to respond? Arigato uh, gozaimasu for that very interesting comment. Mm. A couple um, of things which I would like to point out is that, of course, the interesting thing, I'm glad to be able to connect with a leading representative uh, uh, from uh, Japan, who is also with a Buddhist spiritual tradition. The critical element, as far as I'm concerned in my studies, is that there is a very clear synergy between the Dhamma, the Buddha's teaching, and nature. Mm -hmm. In many ways, the Dhamma emerges out of nature. And because all phenomena are interdependent, and the Buddha often used natural environments as therapy to enable people to deal with their mental health problems. And the extent of mental health issues today, particularly amongst the rich communities throughout the world, is quite considerable. So the other thing which I would like to point out is that there are also positive actions that are taking place throughout the world where nation, where religious communities are coming together and working together, but regrettably, these are not highlighted and these need to be put into the forefront. Finally, the interesting thing is that the Buddha didn't only just talk about suffering. The Buddha also talked about joy. And this is where he highlighted the fact that it was when he was talking about lasting matters, he talked about lasting happiness, lasting welfare and happiness, the need to develop a mindset in concerning world con compassion, to have a global mindset. I think that is the challenge that we face today. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, Phyllis, are you still online? Would you want to say anything from a Jamaican perspective? Or perhaps uh, Robert, from the as IARF Global President, would you like to bring a closing uh, observation? And then we'll ask Don to conclude. Yes, I'm, <coughs> I'm moved by the idea that we have to communicate together um, and what is happening there are people in the world who are who won't accept the perspective that we have on covid on environmental issues uh, and our challenge really is to is to bring people around to recognize the seriousness of the situation um, because within that conflict within the disagreements lie um, far more difficulty, the difficulties that we could do without if we could communicate clearly with the people. And I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, the issues of, uh, shall we say, the Amazon rainforest of, of those countries that, well, Brazil's another classic example of somebody who's refused to accept the, the, the challenges that COVID or should we say the perspective that we have on COVID uh, and how we get to um, 
talk to these people to keep the communications open uh, and ultimately to come to some shared agreement about how the world as a whole challenge uh, solves these problems, not individual countries. Um, I've got plenty of other issues that I would love to talk to you about, Don, but uh, there's too many and we, we, I guess, have run out of time. So thank you very much for your very clear presentation about the, the difficulties that the world faces and how faith could play a part in, 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 in resolving them. So thank you. Don, would you like to make some conclu concluding? Thank you. Concluding? Yes, thank you so much for those comments. This is really quite important. Unfortunately, it is rather sad to see that the UK government is planning to cut down on uh, its commitments to foreign aid, which will further have uh, impacts in terms of mitigating COVID-19 and poverty issues throughout the world. So it is important to try and see how we do this. And we help uh, the, the British population to have a much wider, more inclusive um, uh, process of action. We have, as faith, my final point is that we may have to rethink our role as people of faith. We have been chaplains in many ways on spiritual matters. I think for now and the future, as people of faith, as individuals of faith in our respective communities, we will have to deal now with issues, concerns, mental health issues that deal with environmental challenges. And we will need to be able to work to ready all people who are engaged in faith in responsible situations, in responsible positions of authority or help, volunteers, ministers, people who are engaged in religious matters throughout the world. We will need to be able to now retrain them to be able to link, to, to see that these issues concerning faith, environment and justice deal with the survival of our planet for now and the future. Thank you. Yeah, could we thank Don in a usual manner? Silently, thank you so much. <laughs>